Hi, this is Mike McCabe, Occupy Radio's Daily Briefing. Just This is the night before Election Day, and I wanted to bring to you an interview I did today with uh, Anthony Arias, who is running for State Senate in District 26. So, for the next few minutes, we'll see, you'll see our interview. Uh, Anthony Arias, I'm running for State Senate District 26. Okay. Uh, why don't you give us some background of what the major points of your campaign are right now? Uh, yeah, so the, the major points that we're focusing on for our campaign is the overdevelopment that is seen the displacement of small businesses and affordable housing here in the city, um, followed by the failing MTA system, um, and then just general uh, uh, election and corruption um, that's been going on all the time. The uh, Small Business Job Survival Act is very important to all of the small businesses in the city. Um, how would you get that through? I mean, the, right now, the city council looks like they're 50-50 on the issue, but the mayor has come right out and said that he's opposed to it. How do you think we can uh, change that? Well, as a state senator, Albany has a lot more influence over the laws that happen, not just here in New York City, but across the entire state. And I think that's something that it, you know, I would take up the mantle and start having the conversation and bring you know, bipartisan discussion in Albany um, that if the city council isn't willing to do something like that, then let's figure out how we can do it from a state level that affects all small businesses, you know, uh, you know from New York City all the way up to you know, Buffalo and Syracuse and whatnot. Mm -hmm. As you can tell by the construction noise in the background, there's a lot of construction going around. We're in Lower Manhattan. and. You can go anywhere and see construction going on all throughout the city. Um, the people, the residents in this city are not being listened to. Uh, how can you help those people uh, change the status of where they are right now? Because if they're not donating large sums of money like uh, developers are, they're not going to be heard. Yeah, so I actually have a couple of points on that. Uh, the biggest thing I think, one of the first steps we should take is look at the election reform and one of the first things we need to do is get rid of special interest in corporate money out of politics and political campaigns. Now, so I work with the Stop Revenue Bullies and that's one of their uh, main points is you know, uh, getting special interest out and uh, I think if we do that as our first step it would bring more power and influence back to individuals and people that live here in New York. Mm. Um, so that would be step one. Step two I would look at uh, you know, reviewing all of the tax expenditures, you know, the big tax abatements and cuts that all the luxury developers get, especially here in New York City, um, that has directly uh, led to the increase in property values and property taxes and rents, um, you know, and, and the displacement of small businesses because they can't afford to be here any longer. Um, so if we're able to do that and reverse things such as 421A, which gives out the tax abatement to developers, um, and have them pay their fair share, and instead focus on in a new type of uh, incentive to bring in the type of housing and small business spaces that we want, um, I think that would stop a lot of what's taking place right now um, and bring forward the type of development that you know, New Yorkers want and need at this point. And then from the savings, uh, from getting rid of that luxury tax abatement, we could then apply it to other areas um, that's desperately needed here in the city. For example, I say that that could be used to uh, help fund the resiliency projects such as the Big U here in Lower Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Uh, right now on the ballot, uh, we're going to have these proposals coming from the, the mayor's uh, charter committee. Uh, where do you stand on, on those proposals? Uh, I'm against the, the, the two provisions on the, um, the charter um, that um, I believe that it, it, it's putting too much influence and power back into the city government. I would be more in favor of having um, you know, private individuals being able to have more say and more contributions to what they want to do as long as, again, going back to what I said earlier, that we don't have too much corporate influence and all that. Um, and then I am in favor of the um, ballot initiative to have term limits on our community boards. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been uh, this radio station's uh, thoughts that community board members should be elected by the people. Uh, that's not on the, on the ballot, but it could be on the ballot when the city council's charter committee comes out. Uh, do you have any feelings on that? Uh, yeah, I think that would be great. Um, almost having like uh, mini city councils in all the districts here in New York City. Uh, I think that it would be great to have more power given to the community boards to not just necessarily only be in an advisory role, but actually give them a little bit more teeth 
to push back on uh, the state and the city with initiatives that they want to push through, you know, such as the new jails that they want to put up that you know, a lot of communities haven't been um, uh, uh, talked to about that are coming here. Um, and a lot of the new developments and licenses that you know, business have that uh, really the community boards at the end of the day you know, can strongly recommend either which way, but uh, the city and the state can do whatever they want. All right. Well, you bring up the prisons, and you know, again, in this radio station's belief is it's just another area for the mayor to push his developers because the intention was to reduce the situation that exists in, in Rikers Island where there was overcrowdedness and there was a lot of trouble inside. I don't see any difference when you build a 40-story building with more confined space that you're going to ease that, you're going to make it worse. Plus, there's not enough discussion about mental health issues. Uh, you'll care to comment on that? Uh, yeah, definitely not. So I agree with what you just said. I think a lot of it is to go to special interests that the mayor has here. And um, I know that Rikers does need reform. I'm against closing it. I say let's figure out how we can actually fix Rikers Islands to start with. Um, because if we close Rikers Island but then put up four new um, jail towers throughout the city but have, but have it actually reform the underlying system, then all you're doing is moving the problem from one area to another. In this case, you're putting in the backyards you know, of you know, countless residents here. Um, it's very short-sighted as well. Uh, yeah, it's great that you know, we all want to see the prison population reduced, um, but that's you know, for the short term what happens when the next mayor comes in or three mayors down the road and they have a big uh, crime push. Uh, you know, where are we going to put them all if we no longer have that capacity? Mm -hmm. And I believe that there is enough space on Rikers Island where if you do need to build more capacity, that we should stick there first before coming out. Um, and yes, there's a lot of things that need to be um, taken into consideration, like mental illness, um, and even for you know, minor uh, crimes, like uh, I know that one of the things was like marijuana possession, you know, some of the more nonviolent offenses, that we should have a re-look at um, you know, how much of that is taken up into the prison population and put them on uh, some kind of a bail program um, to take that as one of the first reforms to you know, reduce the prison population. Yeah. A large group of the people that are at Rikers are in there for marijuana. Uh, what's your stance on, on that with the state? Well, I'm in favor of legalizing it across the board. Um, mm -hmm. at, at this point, it's um, you know, uh, relatively harmless and uh, filling up our jail systems with uh, marijuana users or, or drug users, period. Mm -hmm. um, the people that sell it you know, compared to you know, more violent criminals like murder, armed robbery, assault and battery, um, you know, puts more strain onto the system. Um, so if we were to legalize it, you know, get rid of that entire population that's in the jail system right now, um, we would also create a new industry, and then that tax revenue could then be earmarked and put into a lockbox for other projects. Now, in this case, from New York City, I say put that towards helping fund the rebuild the MTA. Right. Well, we would like to see, again, uh, Occupy Radio is in favor of making it easier for individuals to go into those businesses instead of setting up large corporations that will end up making all the money and those people still suffer when they should have been given the opportunity. Do you have any feelings on that? Uh, yes, so I mean, I own two businesses here in New York City. Uh, I know how complicated it is to go through all the red tape just to set up your business. And uh, more times than not, you're in the whole thousands of dollars before you even open the door. And every year, uh, it just feels like there's more regulations and more costs that are put on to small businesses here in the city. And so what's the incentive to really want to stay here when I could go to New Jersey um, or Pennsylvania where it's not going to be as burdensome? Uh, I believe you know, some of the other things such as the occupational licenses just puts another undue burden um, on our small businesses here. And I know a lot of my uh, voters in Chinatown, that's one of their big issues that makes things too complicated. Um, even having to have a food service license. I mean, yeah, it's only a couple of bucks, but at the end of the day, you're adding more red tape and you're making it more difficult for business to operate. So I'm going to review it and smartly see how we can reform it so that you know, there are still some protections there for the general public because we don't, we don't want everything to just go run rampant, but at the same time, how can we make it easier for, uh, in this case, a small business to be able to do what they need to do so that they can become pillars of the community, so that they can become multi-generational businesses that support uh, the fabric and culture of you know, what makes New York City great. Okay. Now, uh, I believe you have nitric buildings in your area, you uh, in lower, lower Manhattan. Uh, again, the radio station believes that uh, all three levels of government have failed NYCHA over, over the decades, particularly the governor who was the head of uh, housing for quite some time. 
He's done nothing, in our opinion, over the last eight years. Uh, what could you do from from uh, Albany? So when it comes to this, it, uh, you know, I say that the money to fix everything that's wrong here in the system, like not most of the money, is already in the system. And what we need to do is, is freeze the budget at the levels that they are right now. We need to go, go through the fine tooth comb and figure out okay, where are the redundancies and inefficiencies and how can we make things run more efficiently. Um, one of the biggest things that I want to be able to target is the tax expenditures. You know, the big tax breaks for, um, you know, in the, let's say for developers, since that's one of our main cornerstones of the campaign, um, which is displacing so much for the community. Why are we giving, uh, at least here in New York City, a billion and a half dollars away um, to, type, to developments that nobody wants anymore? So looking at programs like that, looking at those inefficiencies, you know, get rid of, getting rid of all of that frees up all this extra capital before we have to look at raising taxes or fees or anything else on people, because New York City's, New York is in general already heavily taxed, and then reallocate those funds, put them in lockboxes, and that's where I think Albany can come in there is, you know, force the city and the rest of the state to put these necessary funds into lockboxes that are gonna affect not just, you know, the nice houses here, you know, in District 26, but you know, across all of New York. Um, and look smarter at, you know, how we uh, implement any kind of new developments so first looking at what's the crumbling infrastructure here, you know, how can we reallocate the funds that we have, and then once we've gotten that on a stable foot, okay, now let's look forward, you know, what does the community need and want, and let's figure out some kind of a new type of an incentive package for that kind of uh, business development industries to come into here. Mm -hmm. Now, in your mind, is there any way that we can get together and unify the communities to come up with a, with a definite structure for the city, a true planning? Of the city? Uh, it, it's possible, yes. Uh, you know, I, I sit on the community board, I'm president of the Grand Village of Chelsea Chamber of Commerce, I know how difficult it is to get the, the community unified, but I believe if we sit down and really dive into, you know, what is it that's the core issue that we all want to focus on? You know, not, not to say, okay, well, we want traffic mitigation, we want you know, affordable housing, we want nitro fix, we want MTA fix, but you know, what's the underlying thing that we can all rally around? It's going to be the same cause, you know, whether it's for development, whether it's for the MTA, whether it's for jail systems. You know, um, once we figure that out, I believe that we can start to unify um, most of the communities. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can, so in this case, you know, we say that one of our biggest arguments is looking at the environment, you know, the Clean Air and Water Act. Um, it's already law. It's you know, through the EPA, and the state of New York has the authority to enforce that. And it, it touches on most, if not everything, that the city is doing right now, what the Blasio is trying to accomplish. And uh, we already have that legal footing. It's not like we need new legislation to come into it. So if we as a community and multiple neighborhoods in the city agree to that, you know, clean air and water is our, and sewage is our biggest and main concern, then we can start to rally around a large number of community groups to start pushing back on all those initiatives and come up with a cohesive message for any new development or new initiative that um, any politician wants to do, Republican or Democrat, that the city, uh, that the residents of New York City don't want. Is uh, first, let me ask you. A couple of weeks ago, we did the filming of a Green Party forum, and one of the issues that came up was that I think it was in Long Island City, where the sewers were in such bad shape, they were just pumping the the waste out into the river and paying the fines on a daily basis to the government. How does that make any sense, rather than going out and building a different uh, refuge system somehow? Well, it doesn't make any sense, and it, it, it's disgusting. I mean, that, that affects our quality of life here. And I think this is one of the things that you know, the city and the state need to look at is you know, when we start putting in you know, these new types of legislation um, or the types of development that are going to come into the city, um, you know, regardless of whatever it is, you know, there needs to be a component where we have that forced compliance within the Clean Air and Water Act, and we have funds specifically earmarked from those developers coming in here or whatever that industry is that's coming into New York that's going to first and foremost go to updating our environmental infrastructure so that the capacity as the city grows and, and development grows, hopefully with affordable housing and small space, and small business space, and it's still going to put a strain on our environmental infrastructure. But if we have, you know, for every building that's coming up, you know, the X amount of ratio of uh, funds from that developer put in towards, let's say, the Newtown Creek expansion mm -hmm. or, or in Long Island City or you know, wherever it might be, you know, that's one of the things that we have to do. And same thing with the MTA. Um, and it's something that hasn't been addressed or spoken of you know, with anything that's been going on with any of the development over the last several decades. Should we have a, a citywide uh, group put together a, uh, a category of 
questions to, to fill out uh, for developers to make sure that all of these elements were done? I thought, thought that was part of the city planning to begin with, or is it not? Um, yeah, so there's something with the environmental impact studies that you know, developers do. Uh, however, there's a couple of loopholes in there um, that the developers can take advantage of in terms of how they report um, an entire project. So they can segment it off so it doesn't look as big as it actually is. Mm -hmm. um, which technically is in a gray zone. Uh, I think what we need to do is go through that and close those loopholes to actually have the developer show what the real impact is on a cumulative level across the entire city and across the entire air and watershed. Uh, if we do that, that kind of so that, that will solve most of the issues in terms of the adverse effects that are being underreported here in New York. Mm -hmm. Again, housing is a major issue to the station. And one major complaint that we have is that the Earl Up process is just an appeasement to allow communities to have something to say and then put them away somewhere. Uh, outside of running, is there anything that uh, you think that we can do to change all of that to get the city to listen, to pay attention? Uh, so what we need to do in this case, if none of the city or the state representatives are uh, enforcing any of this one, vote them out and vote for candidates that uh, agree with what the uh, residents of the, uh, New York want to do. Uh, two, I would go after our um, federal representatives. Uh, DC in this case can come over um, with a, a strong hammer on the head of Albany and New York City and force that compliance, if not uh, levy strong fines or moratoriums on development that's going on here in New York. Yeah. Um, that's going to be the biggest thing. And as community groups ourselves, uh, you know, really understand the Clean Air and Water Act. We work with the legal counsel on my campaign uh, that specifically worked on researching you know, what are the legal ramifications we can have to push back on the city you know, and sue the city in this case, or to sue the developers to, to, that can actually show that you've been in violation of the Clean Air and Water Act in this case. And then with that, if we get enough community groups together in this um, instance to see that you know, the environment is our number one concern and we can make our legal argument against the overdevelopment of New York, then we can lodge that with our federal representatives um, you know, in, in the House and in the Senate and go to a lot of the uh, uh, independent watchdog agencies or go to the environmental conservation agencies that we have here in New York and in D.C. Um, to bring light to that issue. Um, and we have plenty of evidence that shows there are very clear violations from all these developers and from the city to do that. Where that we can have, in this case, let's say federal oversight come in, do an analysis, and actually shut it down if that's what the case is. Um, because what a lot of people seem to forget too is that you know the city itself has been in violation of the Clean Air and Water Act for years. And yes, we've made small steps to try and uh, uh, to, to reduce that pollution, but it's still there. And technically, if any of these environmental impact studies were done properly, um, you know there would be no talk, no discussion past that EIS. There would be no ULER, there would be no discussion because you can't build it, it's illegal, and a discussion. Um, but none of our representatives are um, highlighting that issue and pushing back hard enough. Yeah. We've worked with uh, Youth for Displacement and NMAS regarding the four towers that are being proposed in Chinatown. Is that part of your uh, area as well? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the Two Bridges project. Yes. Uh, yeah, so we've been uh, vehemently against the Two Bridges um, for a long time, way before the campaign. And we've worked with a lot of those groups, uh, David too. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we've, uh, we've actually gone to speak at some rallies that they've had there. Uh, and, and again, it's the same thing over and over. It's, it's the violation of the Clean Air and Water Act. It's the lack of community involvement um, in there. You know, we get to the point where we're trying to mitigate, uh, and they just want to give crumbs back to the city you know, when we already have the cake. As we need to protect the cake. You know, this is, um, you know, residents' land. This is New Yorkers' land. This isn't uh, developers' land. This isn't uh, city government. You know, this is our our homes. You know, and uh, what they're doing is just um, uh, despicable. Yeah. Now, one last question before I allow you to uh, speak on on your campaign is that it's a pet peeve that I have that. Uh, people constantly talk about taking money out of politics, and you touched on it briefly earlier. Uh, but that alone is not enough, uh, in my opinion, because there's always the uh, the impression that someone with lots of money has that much more to offer these individuals outside of money, may it be power or something later in office. And I personally would like to see recall laws occur. Uh, do you have any opinion on that? Uh, yeah, I think that that would be a great step. Um, there's many things, there's 
none of these issues that we're talking about are simple issues, and there's going to be multiple points that need to be addressed to really start to fix it and move the needle in the right direction. So when it comes to this, yes, I'd love to see recall laws. Um, I would like to see it actually become easier for challengers to get onto the ballots and, and, and challenge the um, incumbents. Um, in terms of you know, getting rid of special interest money, yeah, you make a good point where, where somebody with a billion dollars can still easily influence an election. You know, well then let's cap out how much people can actually donate um, to a campaign. And for somebody like that, uh, you know, we'll say right, it's $5,000 or whatever it is, but $5,000 across every single political campaign for a year for that individual. So we get rid of that incentive where they can you know, just keep throwing money, get rid of the LLC loophole also you know, for um, especially the real estate companies um, to get rid of all of that. Um, I believe that was uh, all the all the parts of the question. Right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's that's kind of where we need to start um, to, to, to to do all that. I think right now, once you get in, into office, it's very hard to get an incumbent out, uh, and they make it purposely difficult for any challengers to come in. Um, not just Republicans, Democrats, but third parties. I think it should be easier for third parties to come up and push them and uh, really you know, hold the coals to their feet. You know, so right. To speak. All right. And if you look at uh, the history of people, I think not. Uh, Incumbents have like a 95 percent chance of being reelected again. Right. Uh, oh, and, uh, and, and term limits too. Term, term limits. Yeah. Term limits. And I know we have them here in New York City on the City Council. Um, there's no reason why we can't do that uh, up in Albany. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Would you give us a, a statement about your campaign and uh, what you want, would like to say to the to the voters personally? Uh, yeah. So um, no, I'm, I'm a millennial candidate. It's my first time running for office. Like many of you, I have grown frustrated at the lack of progress that we've seen here in New York. I don't believe that any of our elected representatives or most of our elected representatives have our best interests at heart anymore. And as a small business owner, or someone that's lived here in the area, and a community activist for years, it's saddening to see that our neighborhoods are disappearing. Now, the long town neighbors are no longer able to afford living here in New York and have left. Now that my favorite bar, or your favorite bodega, or the trinket shop down the street, has to close down and leave and it's replaced by big chain stores um, or luxury development. Well, I want to be a voice for you. I want to be a new voice to come into Albany to hold accountable uh, all the elected representatives that have allowed uh, the pillaging of all of our city, of all of our neighborhoods across the city uh, to enforce the Clean Air and Water Act, to transparently fund uh, not just the MTA but all of the government agencies across the board so that people have new opportunities um, to advance, uh, especially within NYCHA. And at the end of the day, we should be a loud, persistent voice to using the office of the Senate uh, to really push out the issues and, and highlight the inefficiency, or highlight the corruption that's going on, or highlight the lies that are being told to all of us, um, and really just be a loud, never-ending voice you know, to, to bring true, meaningful, bipartisan change to New York City and to New York. What column are you voting on? Uh, or can you be found on? Uh, yes, I'm on the Republican and the Reform uh, ballot lines. Okay. All right. Thank you, and uh, please remember to vote November 6th. We will. Thank you very much. Thank you.